Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, I just have to get rid of this chat. Okay. Um, I'll be talking about sustainable freedom. And here's the basic idea of the paper. I hold my freedom very dearly because it allows me to pursue my, my own ends. But of course, the pursuit of my own ends is not guaranteed because of all the things that can get in the way. So society needs to provide certain um, circumstances to ensure my freedom. But of course, society exists within the environment. So the, we are now understanding that we must ensure certain features of the environment in order that we might have sustainable freedom to pursue our own ends. So here's the overview of the paper. What should be sustained? My answer is freedom, but of course that implies constraint. And I'm gonna be working with Mill on freedom and the harm principle. The idea of sustainability and where that is located on what you might or might not find attractive, the idea of the left-right distinction in politics. Also consider the distinction between positive and negative freedom. And then I wanna to move to the concept of sustainability in the context of sustainable development, but then apply the harm principle from Mill and the idea of development as freedom from Amartya Sen to address the very, very great challenge of planetary boundaries. They're being exceeded. And so we must balance the planet with our freedom. And I'll, find, I'll, ch I'll just mention some implications and challenges at the end. So what should be sustained? Of course, I'm gonna say freedom, but I, I just wanna to touch on the fact that sustainability is a ubiquitous concept, but it's also a very ambiguous concept. I think a lot of people rather too quickly say, of course, I want sustainability, but what is it that you want to sustain? Indeed, sustainability might be mistakenly pursued as an end, but it's not an end. It relates to a means to an end. One uses a means sustainably toward an end. And toward what end? In other words, what's the purpose of life? Of course, that's a big question. And I will assume that it's up to an individual to choose the purpose of their life. Not everybody would agree, but that's obviously where I'm coming from. So an individual gets to choose the purpose of their own life. But then of course, the question arises, how should society be structured to facilitate that choice? Society should facilitate individual freedom. Quoting Mill, the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way. So our own good is the end whatever that means to an individual and pursuing it in our own way requires freedom. So society should facilitate the freedom of the individual. Freedom is the highest moral value because it gives an individual the highest chance of achieving happiness, however happiness is conceived. And I admit of a very wide range of conceptualizations of happiness but it's that political or moral or social value of freedom that allows an individual to pursue, perhaps not to achieve, but to pursue happiness. But of course, this goes for everybody. So we pursue our own freedom so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. And all that is given that all individuals have the same freedom this yields Mill's famous harm principle. The only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against their will is to prevent harm to others. Now, the question of what constitutes a harm is a complex question. For, harm, for Mill, harm is explicitly defined as the obstruction of liberty. So I'm harmed when I'm prevented from living my life my way. Harm is the obstruction of personal freedom. 
Of course, not everybody agrees with that notion of harm, but that's the, the concept of harm that I'm running with. Mill's harm principle has been subject to much critical analysis. And one dimension of that analysis is what constitutes a harm. There are many different positions on what constitutes a harm, but this presentation will consider exceeding planetary boundaries as a harm, because presumably it limits the freedom of future humans. Now that's where we're we gonna end up at planetary boundaries, but before we get there, I just wanna unpack a couple of further themes. So where is concern for sustainability on the left, right political spectrum? How does Berlin's distinction between positive freedom and negative freedom fit in? Do we have an obligation to future generations to ensure their freedom? How, or how does this all relate to sustainable development? And how do Amartya Sen's ideas in development as freedom fit in? So I'm not particularly comfortable with the left-right conceptualization of politics. Perhaps it's not really of much use, or perhaps it's outdated. It might be built on political ideas that are vanishing from the landscape. But let me use that left-right distinction to explore the question of who is interested in sustainability. Often sustainability seems to be an issue of the left, but I don't think that's actually true if you consider the question more clearly about what's being sustained. Because I suggest that sustainable freedom is actually a very centrist idea. And if you abandon the left-right distinction, then it's just central to the idea of our politics. What is sustainable freedom? Of course, Isaiah Berlin made the distinction between positive and negative freedom. Negative freedom is based on the assumption that we are free by default. The idea is that all fully rational adults have this freedom, but advocates of positive freedom argue that true freedom, positive freedom, does not exist by default. Positive freedom is based on the assumption that we must have access to certain resources, physical, intellectual, emotional, social, financial, and of course, environmental resources in order to be able to flourish in the way that might be expected of those who are free. So I think of sustainable freedom as a form of positive freedom. Imagine a world in the future, dystopian world in the future where all of those nominally free individuals are living in a degraded landscape then their negative freedom might not be worth much. But if they're living in a flourishing, balanced environment, then that is positive freedom at at least, at least one dimension of positive freedom. This all depends, well, my whole argument depends on the, the assumption that we have obligations to future generations. So do we have an obligation to provide freedom to future generations? Providing freedom to others now, our peers, could be understand, understood as a pragmatic move. If you provide freedom for me, I'll provide freedom for you. So a reciprocal relationship. But we have no reciprocal relationship with the future. So what motivates us? Well, sadly, we might not be motivated. Indeed, that might be a good explanation for much of human behavior at present. But independently from motivation, I will assume we do have an obligation to future generations to provide them with freedom, simply because we recognize their humanity, we recognize the value we put on freedom, and so by implication, we honor the freedom that they should enjoy. So now I want to sort of pull a couple of themes together, sustainable development and the harm principle. So the Brundtland definition of sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present 
without compromising the future generation, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I hope you see Mill right there. I assume freedom is one of the needs of both the present and future generations. The only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. I think there's a beautiful parallel between the Brundtland definition of sustainable development and Mill's insight. All individuals have the same freedom, which yields Mill's harm principle. The only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against their will is to prevent harm to others. Also, I think this is implicit or explicit indeed in Amartya Sen's development has freedom. Development consists of the removal of various types of unfreedoms that leave people with little choice and little opportunity of exercising their reasoned agency. The removal of substantial unfreedoms, it is argued by Sen, is constitutive of development. So sustainable development is to be pursued. Development is to be understood as freedom, or more precisely, removing unfreedom. So Sen is advocating for sustainable positive freedom. So sustainable freedom is freedom that does not prejudice future freedom. So what needs to be done to sustain freedom? Well, there are a number of things that need to be done to sustain positive freedom, including the maintenance of certain political arrangements, for example, ensuring democracy, however imperfect that system is, public health arrangements, provision of free healthcare, perhaps, certain educational arrangements, provision of free education, perhaps. But today, I'll be focusing on ensuring that the planetary boundaries are not exceeded. So the Stockholm Resilience Centre, there's their website if you want to have a look, are doing some very good work on planetary boundaries. These are the, uh, one way of thinking about this is good housekeeping. Depending on where you are on environmentalism, how you conceive your relationship to the environment, the, a very, very straightforward and very accessible notion is the idea of good housekeeping. What we are doing is not good housekeeping currently because some of the planetary boundaries are being exceeded. So what we need to do is to become good housekeepers at the very least. So balanced against freedom, is the acknowledgement that human action has impacted negatively on the planet, such that the planetary boundaries are being exceeded. The Stockholm Resilience Centre identifies nine planetary boundaries as follows. Biosphere integrity, climate change, novel entities, stratospheric ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosol loading, ocean acidification, biogeochemical flows, freshwater use and land system change. And of these nine, four are believed to have exceeded the boundary. So biospheric integrity, often understood as loss of biodiversity, Ge biogeochemical flows, and that's things like the nitrogen runoff, so nutrient runoff off agricultural land, say, that may be going into streams and rivers and ending up in places like the Great Barrier Reef, changing the nature of the water. Land system change, so the forests, clearing of forests to move it to agricultural land or the change from uh, complex ecosystems, monocultures, and of course, climate change that is in the news. But notice it's not the problem that is most severe. We need to be looking at things like biogeochemical flows and biospheric integrity, but all of them are a worry. So let me return to the central concept of this paper sustainable freedom to pursue one's own ends. But sadly, this is threatened. So compromised biosphere integrity, biogeochemical flows, land system change and climate change all threaten sustainable freedom to pursue one's own ends. So freedom as understood by Mill, 
Berlin and Sen is threatened when planetary boundaries are exceeded. Mill's harm principle should be applied across the set of present and future generations of humans to ensure planetary boundaries are not exceeded. Power can be rightly exercised over any member of a human community against their will to prevent planetary boundaries being exceeded. This is justified because exceeding the planetary boundaries will limit the freedom of individuals in future generations. And this is not news. Uh, we, we have known this for some time. And here's some of the ways that this has been presented in the past. So we can think of our world if we wish to. Many people don't like this idea, but we can think of our planet as natural capital. So the, and we can use the idea of capital to understand that. The widely accepted definition of economic sustainability is maintenance of capital or keeping capital intact. Thus Hicks definition of income, the amount one can consume during a period and still be as well off at the end of that period can define economic sustainability as it devolves on consuming value added interest rather than capital. The planet is capital and maintaining the planetary boundaries keeps our environmental capital intact. It is also, it also is a requirement for the sustainability of freedom. Humanity must learn to live with the limit, within the limits of the biophysical environment. Environmental sustainability means natural capital must be maintained, both as a provider of imports, inputs, sources, and as sinks for waste. This means holding the scale of the human economic subsystem to within the biophysical limits of the overall eco ecosystem on which it depends. Environmental sustainability needs sustainable consumption by a, sustain, a stable population. On the sink side, this translates as holding the waste emissions within the assimilative capacity of the environment without impairing it. On the sources side, harvest rates of renewables must be kept within regeneration rates. Sustainable development may be summarily defined as development of a kind that does not prejudice future development. It is intended to function essentially as a criterion for what is to count as acceptable environmental modification. Although we may not be able to predict the future human needs with any precision, we can be sure that any future human development will require resources, sinks, and life-sustaining systems. Of course, there is uncertainty. These are complex, physical systems. So if we are to sustain freedom, we need to be respectful about the uncertainty of the science. But that does not mean putting things off. It means applying the precautionary principle. So principle 15 of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development states, in order to protect, in order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities. Where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, the lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. So what I have offered is a planetary boundaries version of Mill's Haar principle. So these are very basic, classic, standard concepts within our past. We have thought about this for a long time and we can clearly articulate the way forward. Power can be rightly exercised over a member of the human community against their will to prevent planetary boundaries being exceeded. But this is not an easy path. There are challenges. Indeed, can the harm principle be applied to this challenge? There are arguments that often are offered in response. Any one person's action will be of such small contribution to any planetary boundary being exceeded, then why should we do this? But consider the human response to the realization that CFCs were damaging the ozone layer. We were successful in banning the use of CFCs. Other questions are is international law capable? of applying this version of the harm principle? Would nation states apply the harm principle in the absence of other states doing so? 
Or does the harm principle go far enough? Do we actually know what would be prohibited? And what would we be free to do? These are profound questions, but they're important questions. Thank you very much.